reflecting on justice is the best use of me. I'm not a thought leader. I'm not a visionary. But I can create community. I firmly believe that if enough of us shift, the world will shift with us. We can't leave each other behind. Because you're not really meant to do this alone. We're all still learning too. A powerful quote by my special guest today, a friend of mine, Abby Chow. Abby is an incredible professor at the Adler University in Canada. She's also a supervisor as well as a registered clinical counselor. She runs a group practice dedicated to anti-oppressive practice. Her current life and work both focus on one question. How do we intentionally prioritize justice doing in our everyday lives? This question led her to creating the Reflecting on Justice program, which she is here to talk about with us today. A tough and a very important topic for everyone to not only talk about, but also to be accountable to doing the work. When it comes to justice doing, we are all learning. In a fast-paced world, many of us struggle with overthinking and worry that leaves us feeling overwhelmed or stuck. In this podcast, we will hear stories of successful individuals and have conversations and ways to reach our true potential by embracing every micro detail of our identity, especially the flaws that make us unique. This is your host, Maria Grace Wolf. I'm a Filipino-American entrepreneur, psychotherapist, and mom of two boys. And my mission is to amplify diverse perspectives and experiences and inspire your journey to wellness and fulfillment. I'm sitting on my desk in front of a Zoom call with over 400 to 600 professional attendees back in 2020 and 2021 amid a global pandemic. The murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the rise in racially motivated violence against Asian Americans, may their souls rest in peace, ignited our continuous fight against social injustices. The DEI team, which stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Team from a leading biotech corporation, reached out to me and other psychotherapists, psychologists, to help facilitate dialogue circles within their company. We met as a big group first and then broke down into smaller sessions, each led by a therapist, as to make sure we provide the space for everyone to feel safe and supported to voice their concerns, worries, frustrations, despair. We weren't just there to talk about it. We wanted to make sure that they came out of these meetings with resources and ways on how to cope if you are affected and how to be accountable if you are not in the marginalized group. Lessons on how to be an ally. We knew that we wouldn't come out of there with a solution, but we can at least come together as a community and feel supported by each other. Part of my goal was to educate the importance of self-compassion when doing this work. Understanding that we will make mistakes, we may say the wrong things, but when we are corrected, it's important to not react in a defensive manner or to feel shame, as these are common, these are the common reaction, but instead to learn from that mistake. Because oftentimes, that person who corrected you is not trying to shame you, but holding themselves accountable to doing their part of the work. The expectation is not to be perfect, but to have the learning mindset and curiosity. I'm so glad you have joined me in my conversation with Abby as we dive deeper into this topic. Hi, Abby. Thank you again for being here with me today. Please start us off by telling us your story. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to start by locating myself socially. So I'm a cis, able-bodied, straight-sized, half-gen racialized settler from Hong Kong. So my family and I moved here when I was very young. And because we immigrated here, coming to terms with all the systemic things associated with being an immigrant, I had to take care of a lot of stuff when I was younger. I resonate with that. And I'm sure many others who immigrated here at a young age Because children of immigrants, they have to grow up fast, learning to have that strong obligation to support the families, 
to help their families financially, and they even feel the need to live or go to a college near their parents so they can continue to help them. It's really impacted my journey of coming here, having to take on that responsibility, and has always informed my politics, which is how I do my work now. If that makes sense. So, so because we grew up in a very, we were very working class, and so a lot of my life, my story was other people telling me that I was the golden ticket for them to get out of certain circumstances. I actually built my life around very colonialist, capitalist values of success. What success looks like is making a lot of money. It's being seen as like a higher status kind of person with your job and with the positions that you hold in society. And so that eventually got me into a graduate program where all of that shifted. I was radicalized in my graduate program and really got into a space of redefining everything I thought my life was and questioning all these values around colonialism and capitalism and just systemic oppression as a whole. And then since then, it's really taken over my life and has become something that, as my supervisor would say, is the best use of me to make some in whatever way that looks like. And so that's why I'm here, really wanting to put something out there that can support folks in doing this work if they wanted to. Abby, in our previous conversation, you mentioned that everything that you thought you knew, everything that you thought was your fault growing up, isn't really your fault. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, it was like a huge, like psychic shift, if that makes sense. I, it was in class where I had that realization because the class that I was in, what they do is they explain all these structures and then they give you like a video that's very graphic around what that actually looks like in, in reality. And so what shifted for me was something that I can't even put into words. I just, on the way home, I just kept crying and crying and crying oh and crying. God. And I didn't really know what was shifting until I stopped crying and could think about it. And it was this idea of, okay, so everything I've taken on as my fault, everything that I've taken on as my defect is actually not my defect. Like I actually am just responding to a system that wants me to believe in my defect and responding to a system that wants me to believe in my defect and then try my best to win at this game that's unwinnable and that is harmful. Then there was a moment where I stepped outside of myself. I'm a little ashamed to say how long it took, but I stepped outside myself and I realized that I was actually really privileged to be able to get to that realization when I was in grad school. Uh -huh. And not before, because, you know, when you're experienced so much, when you're experiencing so much systemic harm, you understand this reality a lot earlier. And so I got to grad school before I even had to confront that. And there was almost this shame of everything I've centered my life around, everything I've, the one thing I've hold onto as what I'm moving towards is what is causing all of this pain. And so really coming to terms with like my complicity in that and what I was perpetuating and then just having to do something about it. And I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I don't want it to sound like, oh, I'm so great and what, whatnot. Like I've made so many mistakes. And that's what really leads me into building the program the way that I've built it or the membership the way that I've built it is that like our mistakes are supposed to be nourishing and our mistakes are supposed to be held in accountability instead of punished because that's such a carceral, a colonialist way of dealing with things. Like experiencing racism throughout my life, I've always thought oh, that's just because I wasn't good enough. I didn't live up to the standard that was created by these folks. I wasn't perfect enough. Perfectionism is such a white supremacist thing. It's a tactic of that, right? And so like blaming a lot of myself of I'm not good enough. I'm not, um, I didn't do well enough for people to respect me was a, as, was a huge theme when in fact, like respect isn't something that you earn, so to speak. Like, you can lose it when you do something crappy, but like at a baseline, being human should gather you respect, right? Absolutely. I mean, respect means you you accepting somebody for who they are, even when they're different from you or even if you don't agree with them, because respect builds safety. So you shouldn't have to have to earn safety. And I think a lot of that comes out in the form of scapegoating, right? So I made a mistake. I had to take full responsibility for it. When other people had to make made a mistake, I had to take responsibility for it because I contributed, quote unquote, to it. For other people I was observing, that wasn't the case. When they made a mistake, it was like, it's okay. Like you make mistakes. Like it's yeah. like, that's normal. And 
before I had this lens of understanding systemic oppression and understanding the biases that go into how people decide to treat each other, even very much unconsciously a lot of times, it was just because, oh, this person doesn't like me enough. I, my personality, my person isn't good enough to deserve that kind of kindness. Or maybe I haven't shown them. Maybe I F up too much that they've lost that trust in me. So that's where my mind would have gone. Instead of seeing, oh, wait, hold on. That's unfair to me. <laughs> I'm not being treated well here. And I deserve something that that values me for me. So that's kind of some of the, the stuff that would play out in the form of like other identities as well. Thanks for sharing that, Abby. I mean, yep, you're right. All other identities, like you mentioned. And that's why so many of us feel so lost. Experiencing racism and microaggressions all our lives from childhood to adulthood and not knowing the impact it has on our identities, our overall sense of self, this can lead to really not fully knowing who we truly are. We are constantly navigating, revising our identities to fit in the different spaces and places. We get to this point where we don't even realize that we had been masking ourselves in order to fit in. You mentioned perfectionism, feeling like we always have to do things perfectly in order to you know, get that promotion or, or being passed on for promotion, right? Feeling like no matter what we do, our work isn't good enough. We, we are not good enough. And these, these thoughts, right, they take a toll on how we view ourselves because all of these are directed towards our internal self, that something is wrong with us and not the society. The society who sees me not for my skills, not for my accomplishments, but for as a person of color first. And all of the stereotypes that are attached to that lens. And sitting here listening to your story, it reminded me of my own journey before the realization and understanding of what is really the root of it all. I remember that how I found it so difficult to speak up in a room full of people, full of people who don't look like me. And I thought that maybe I had nothing valuable to contribute, that I am not smart enough, that I don't, I don't belong, or other self-defeating negative self-talk. But taking a step back to just look at the bigger picture, it's realizing that this is not my first rodeo. This is not the first time that I am in this type of situation. This is a repeat of a previous meeting when I did speak up. And guess what? I was either ignored, I was dismissed, or got my head bit off. So this time, I'm staying quiet because it's the best option for me. I have learned to behave within the system that I am in, and I learned how to keep myself safe because, there is, because there's no one out there to stand up for me nor to protect me. So the best option for me at that time is to be invisible. And the moment I realized that, it was definitely something that I knew I needed to unlearn. And so I am continuously learning. I am continuously unlearning all of these things that, that does not serve me. So how do you prioritize justice? And how do you keep learning and unlearning the systemic oppression? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's hard because it's so much easier to fall back into something that the system perpetuates and wants you to be in. And so a lot of times it's surrounding myself with people who are in this work, okay. surrounding myself with people who are in the fight. And so it motivates you to stay in it and it motivates you to kind of um, remember, remember why you're here mm -hmm. when it's when it's hard. And then more logistically speaking, it's also immersing myself in that content, not letting my privilege shield me from the realities of the world, because I think a lot of times that's what happens. We have, with privilege, you have the ability to just stop caring if you wanted to, because it doesn't affect you personally. And so never letting that be the case, never letting myself be like, oh, I'm just going to turn it off because I, it doesn't affect me. Always turning into that content, whether that's with my clients or with podcasts and other content that anti-oppression educators put out or reading or engaging in the community, doing direct action work, like never really letting myself turn away 
even though I could, and it would be easier, like keeping myself in that arena. Yeah, I think it's really easy to learn about the things that happen in the world and be like, oh, that's really sad, and then go back into your life. And that in itself is such a privilege to be able to give sympathy and to not feel like you need to do something about it. And so part of prioritizing justice is to make sure that I'm always staying complicit. I'm always reminding myself that it's not something that I can just be sympathetic about. It's something that I'm responsible for. I completely agree. It's a personal commitment, right? It's a personal yeah. commitment to, to act on it, which means just having the courage to, to use your voice, to interrupt others when they make racist remarks or jokes, just like highlighting any microaggressions that you observe making notes of all the subtle or unsettled discriminations that you see in your everyday mm -hmm. lives. You have to look at your safety as well. Assess your safety. I think it's good to stick up for someone. I just like helping educate others. I think mm -hmm. that's part of the, the work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and gathering allies. Sometimes we aren't in the position of power enough to be responsible for doing that. And so like, how do we collaborate and in, in ensuring that the world that we are going to live in the future is going to be one that's different than now? as much as possible. Yes, gathering allies, being a student, as well as being a teacher and mm -hmm. recognizing your own biases, like you mentioned. So race talk is always a difficult conversation. People usually just sway away from it. I think it always brings up that discomfort, uncomfortable feeling. And so sometimes it doesn't get talked about. So what do you do with the negative feelings and the tough discourse in the justice conversation? Yeah, I think that's the thing that like keeps people from living their ethics and living their values most of the time because it, it requires you to look into yourself in a way that's so uncomfortable and hurts and there's a lot of shame involved and there's not a lot of acknowledgement for how difficult it is. And I get that. There's just so many dynamics associated with that. I think what is really important is to give yourself that space and take that responsibility for yourself to manage your emotions. It's not that your emotions are not valued and that it's not valid, but it's not anybody else's responsibility but yours. So taking the time to let yourself be in that deep shame, that deep hurt, that deep, oh my gosh, I'm a horrible human being. And then coming back to the big picture, that this isn't really about you. Like it's about you, but it's not really about you. It's about like generations of systemic harm. It's about generations of just colonial violence and you were like a fish in this fish tank. There's no way you could have been anything but who you are right now. And that's okay. And that's not your fault. But now that it's your responsibility to do what you, what would be in alignment with your ethics to move the world into a different place for you, for your children, for other people's children, for everybody who lives and breathes and deserves to exist in this world. Yeah, really taking that time to yourself so that you're managing your emotions, but then also zooming out that it's not really about yourself, right? Like decentering yourself whenever you can. What is the single thing that helped you the most in unlearning biases that you didn't know you had? Yeah, being in, in community, I've learned so much. The way that we do supervision is we actually have a group of people and we all talk about the things that we're engaging in and the issues that are arising. And I don't think I would have been able to unlearn in the same way if it was just me doing the work because you don't know what you don't know. When you're engaging in spaces with other people and you're really listening intently to their experiences, you start to unravel something that you just wouldn't have come into contact with. So that has been huge for me. Another one that has been really helpful is to lean into discomfort and lean into pain instead of shying away from it. I think we're biologically built to shy away from pain. Right. That's generally where a lot of the unlearning comes from. Something is hurting you. Why is it hurting you? Or why did it have the effect that it had on the people around you when you when you did the thing that you did, like when you were argumentative and your whole entire team just shut up? Why did that happen? It's really uncomfortable to interpret that and to interrogate that. Why would you? Because then you're going to bring up the same feelings and we don't want to feel that. Yeah. And usually people will just ignore it. Mm -hmm. We'll just go, you know what? I'm not going to think about it again. Let's just push it aside and it'll never happen again. But yet it will. It'll just come back up and then... They will never know what triggered it. Yeah. Yeah. They will just never know. And I think that does them a disservice. Yeah. Because there's a certain psychic pain to knowing what your ethics are and knowing what your values are as a person. 
and then having that in the back of your mind that you're not really living it, like that misalignment, I think mm-hmm. is also very painful. So I guess if I were to be more accurate with my words, it's mm-hmm. choosing the type of pain that's going to move you towards the type of person you want to be. They're not going to be able to know if they don't look at themselves and start questioning, like, how did I get here? Change always starts from within. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much for pulling that quote from their website, because I really believe that if enough of us shift, then the world will shift with us. But we need to shift first. And that shift starts with how are we showing up in the world differently? Mm -hmm. How are we relating to each other differently that these systems can't co-opt us as a person to maintain it. That's the only thing we really have control over. I'm not an activist. I don't identify as an activist. I don't think I've earned the title of an activist. They do such great work to build mutual aid groups, to dismantle policies that are harmful, to protest. And they've done so much. What I can do, what I'm capable of in this moment is to make sure I show up differently and to listen to them and do what I can to support them. And I think everybody has access to that. Not everybody can be in activist work, but everybody can show up differently. And so that's really what I'm hoping to support people with. What's going to make a difference is how you show up and how you teach your children to show up and how you teach other people to show up by setting yourself as the example and deciding what is okay and what is not okay. One of the adages that are, that's coming to mind is hurt people, right? So if you can show up in a way of radical love and and engage in genuine conversations and compassionate conversations instead of conversations around like, how do I understand this enough so I can do the right thing? Then it becomes a complete shift in Mm -hmm. itself. You start a new movement in that, right? You start building on this new reality that could exist that people didn't know could exist. And that in itself is motivating. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. I'm just like spewing words at you. It really (laughs) doesn't make sense. I think just taking the time to educate yourself, following people on Instagram that are social justice forward, reading books. I believe that education, knowing history, knowing what's happening right now is really helpful to be even more social justice driven. Yeah. There's so many people out there who are so great. If your audience is more like psychotherapist, I would recommend like Vicki Reynolds or Travis Heath. They have solidarity talks on, Vicki does solidarity talks with a bunch of folks who are doing change work. Reynolds is your supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. I talk about her a lot. She's been very pivotal in my, in my growth and in, in just keeping me accountable to my ethics. Travis Heath is amazing. He's a kind of narrative therapist and other influencers who are not necessarily therapists. The one that comes to mind is Alok. Alok is a trans activist who has just amazing insights. He, everything he says is like poetry and it just hits so hard. And so highly, highly recommend Alok as well. A-L-O-K. Their pronouns are they, them. Okay. Yeah. It's just so many people that I can think. Adrian Marie Brown is amazing. She's written a lot of books around that. For disability justice, Mia Mingus has a blog called Leaving Evidence, I believe. That's been really great. Lydia XE Brown is somebody that I follow all the time. They are a disability rights lawyer, I believe, and lecturer. Yeah, just so many amazing people. Like, just their the way their minds work just fascinate me. And I'm so grateful that they put their work out there because there's so much learning to be done through what they know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to add that to the show notes for people to look up. I know you're starting a new program, a new membership program. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Th- thank you for asking that. I, I had this idea about a year ago around really wanting to support people in building community the way that I have community because it's just made it's made such a big difference. And recognizing that 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 is the best use of me and I can be the one to facilitate this. And so we created, I say we because I roped along my friend who's now my business partner and co-creator to help me with this, but we created the Reflecting on Justice membership, which is a uh, 
monthly subscription to access content that we create and also access our community. So for the first week of the month, we drop a new piece of content that we all engage in together as a group. The second week of the month, we have reflection prompts around that piece of content to help us really dissect and dive deep into what it is that we're working with and how that packs into our life and what that means for us as people, not Mm -hmm. just clinicians, but as people. And then the third week, we all come together and we sit in a Zoom call and have like fireside chats just to talk to people about this thing that we're unlearning, this thing that we're trying to integrate into our lives. So it's going to be like a Zoom meeting where everybody just hangs out and like actually gets a chance to talk to other people about it because systemic oppression is not something that comes up in everyday conversation a lot of times. And so having that dedicated space where we know that everybody's here trying to do something different and having those conversations can be so just liberating in itself. And so the third week we have a spaces for that. And then the final week, we just do some celebrations because I think collective liberation is all about joy as well and celebrating the wins that we have. And so we have that kind of set up. And then throughout the month, when you join, you also get access to our Discord, which is our online, we called it the Justice in Action community, where you could just hang out with people, voice chat and like direct message other people in the group and stay connected if you need support and things like that. So that's what we're building and what we're going to be launching in the fall. Yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> that's amazing. I would say get on her website, visit her website at reflectingonjustice.com. If you sign up for our free essentials checklist, you'll be put on our, our email list, which will include a link to our wait list. Yeah. That's awesome. Abby, tell us how we can find you. You can find us at Reflecting on Justice on Instagram. So that's at Reflecting on Justice. Our website is reflectingonjustice.com. And if you want to get in touch with me, if there's any other recommendations that you're looking for or anything, feel free to get in touch. Our email address is hello at reflectingonjustice.com. I'm happy to chat and see how we can support you in your justice journey. Abby, again, thank you so much. I am, I'm truly grateful for all the work that you're doing. This was such an important, honest, hard, and reflective conversation that I have had the privilege of having with you today. So thank you again. And if there was one takeaway from this conversation, I would say that taking responsibility for change is something that we all can do and must do to create that beautiful shift to a kinder world. So we need to be the one to take that lead within ourselves first. I am so looking forward to having you on again, Abby. Again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a fun conversation. I really appreciate sharing space with you. If you resonate at all with the stories on this podcast and you're thinking about a change in your current situation, in your career, in your relationship, or maybe even in yourself, what's holding you back from taking the first step? Find out by taking the What's Your Biggest Self-Sabotage quiz that you can find on my website at mariagracewolf.com. Until next time, stay kind and own your journey. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. This is given with the understanding that neither the host nor the guest are providing legal, mental health, or other professional information. If you need a professional, you should find one. This podcast does not substitute for personal professional services.